they say time is a big healer and 30 years is a very long time for any wound to heal but this wound is still fresh and it oozes every now and then when we remember that fateful night of january 19 1990 kashmiri hindus they become refugees in their own land half a million noble souls half a million peaceful people were hounded like animals and they were given just three options embrace islam die or flee and it has been 30 years that kashmiri hindus are still waiting to go back to their home viewers it's the 30th anniversary of the kashmiri holocaust or the genocide day and we remember those souls who perished in that hegemony in that mayhem which was inflicted on those peaceful souls today we have very august panel of speakers with me i'm so glad to introduce our very uh, eminent speaker and a big voice in north america shri rajiv malhotra ji rajiv ji namaskar and we have tom kugan he is a specialist on anti terrorism tom welcome to tech tv So Rajiv ji uh, we are remembering January 1990 it's been 30 years and we are still waiting to go home the world remained silent then the world still is silent there is secularism in non availability of internet in the valley but nobody cares about us who haven't gone back to their home for the last 30 years i like your opinion about it well i am uh honored and delighted to have come here this morning from new jersey where i live to join my kashmir brothers and sisters kashmiri brothers and sisters to commemorate this very important event so that the world won't forget you know about uh, 15 years ago i was invited uh, to ottawa at a uh, holocaust jewish holocaust memorial event they were Uh, commemorating some anniversary of the holocaust museum there and they wanted a representative from each faith so i was the hindu representative there and i remarked in my talk that there are other genocides and other holocausts that also ought to be commemorated i also went to the holocaust museum in washington i've been to several places where they're doing genocide studies i don't find Kashmir, the Kashmir genocide represented, and I think it should be in textbooks. There should be a campaign. I congratulate you for starting this. I would hope that you make it into a regular thing, a certain day every year, so you build up more and more. The government should be involved. After all, if something like if there were an event on uh, Islamophobia, a lot of politicians would show up. Absolutely. But if there is an event on what happened to the Hindus. where are the politicians that's true so i think we we need to all come together and make this happen and i'm very glad that you've taken the initiative and we should all help you in that thank you so much really appreciate it thank you ah uh, tom you have studied terrorism across the world so 30 years back when we talked about terrorism when we talked about radicalization of islamic people in kashmir probably nobody took note of it but when september 11 happened suddenly the world took a notice that yes islamic radicalization is something which is happening just under our nose you have studied it so thoroughly i want your views about it how the world looks at it today after 30 years and what's happening not only in india or the subcontinent what's happening in our own canada Yes, well for, first uh once again thank you Mayor. thank you very much for inviting me to this. My interest in Kashmir currently is is not so much on the past as it is the present and the future. Uh and you talk about returning and at this point I would say there's not a lot of reason to be optimistic this year maybe in the future I don't know but my So 
hopefully, and this is where, where my studies take me, is we say, when we talk about Islamist extremism, and I don't talk about Muslim extremism or Islamic extremism, I talk about Islamist extremism, the extremism brought to us by political Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood, Jam Islamiyah, uh, the Abu Sayyaf group, all those sorts of folks. Um, what I'm seeing right now in the region, and by that I mean Pakistan, India, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, see huge amounts of money pouring into that region from the outside, specifically with the idea of going to local madrasas, local schools, local mosques, local so-called cultural centers in order to spread the word of extremist Islam. And that money used to come from places like Saudi Arabia or maybe Kuwait to a certain degree. But currently the biggest problem is Qatar, or Qatar, depending how you choose to pronounce it. They, uh, using groups like Qatar Charity and Eid Charity, are spending billions of dollars in about 70 countries around the world to create a problem of Islamist extremism. Pakistan is probably their biggest single area. Not far behind that is India. And then of course, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh all make up part of the same region. But interesting enough, when I'm just now starting to plot out where all the projects are, where the money's going, most of it's winding up in the sort of Punjab area of Pakistan or to the Kashmir area. So it's continuing. I think the state of Qatar, the country of Qatar, is continuing the old pattern in Kashmir, which is to say, get into Kashmir, take over larger parts of Kashmir, grow the Islamist influence in Kashmir, because that is the entry port to India. Uh, so at the moment, given the amount of money going in there and giving where it's coming from, uh, it doesn't look optimistic. The ray of sunshine or the ray of hope as I see it is right now in the Middle East, we're seeing the whole mess with Iran, with the attack on the uh, American embassy and the killing of Suleimani, who is like literally the guy in charge of the world's most well-funded terrorist group, the Al-Quds Force, with his disappearance, with the pressure on Iran, people are now starting to realize there is a growing alliance between Qatar Iran, Turkey, and to a certain degree, Pakistan and Malaysia. And that's sort of the, I hate to call it, you know, the axis of evil, because that's an overworked term, but sort of the axis of the Islamist, or that's the area where that force is moving through. So with the focus on Iran right now, maybe folks will start paying a little more attention to not just the Middle East, but everywhere else it's spreading from there. I want you to tell me a little bit more. You have been studying, you know, the terrorism across the world and you have many books about it, and you are basically going into the realm of it, like what are the reasons how people get radicalized, and probably how do we basically counter check it? So can you give me a view about it? Well, you know, the reason I feel Kashmiris became vulnerable is that at some point in their history, they lost the Kshatriya, Varna. Whenever Brahmins are left alone to themselves, they're going to be exposed. They're vulnerable. Uh, this morning I spoke with my mother in Delhi. She's 94. And I told her what I'm here for, and she was very proud of me. She said, you know, we Punjabis also face this uh, genocide in, uh, at the time of partition. So we have uh, we have a lot of sympathy for what uh, what the Kashmiris have are, are, have gone through. So I started thinking about uh, what happened to Punjab. Similar story. Uh, now, the difference is that in Punjab, the it took almost it took a thousand years for the Muslims to keep coming forward. It was a very long process uh, because of the Kshatriyata the fighting spirit, sure. that never died. There was always, and I would, I would thank the Sikhs for that, uh, there was always uh, the, the three choices given, as you said, were convert, get killed, or run away. The Sikhs took the fourth choice saying, I'll fight back. Resist, I'll confront. Now, this kshatriyata is needed uh, in order for a community to survive. And this is, in the case of Punjab, unlike a mountain where you can hide, 
you can go in a valley you can have a little village you can nobody will find you because far away uh and you know nobody is going to come with the army of 10000 horses it's not so easy to do that or an army of th- a few thousand elephants is not easy to do that in the plains the fighting is very fierce because you have all kinds of weapons on the plains of punjab and there's nowhere to hide so when somebody like that comes either you're going to run or you're going to get killed or you can confront hit fight back so the punjab people did that for a very long time and i think there are some lessons to be learned for that the lessons being that uh, when we say the genocide of uh, or ethnic cleansing of kashmiri pandits it should not be just pandits because they are, that's the brahmin part hindus, hindus. Yeah. see what was left were pandits that's true but then you have to realize that at one point in time kashmir was a thriving kingdom very powerful it had kshatriyas it had vaishyas it had it had all the varnas that's true. so those guys one by one got decimated they converted they or you know whatever happened so this breakdown of the different kinds of society the different elements of society made the brahmins sort of isolated and uh, they were left alone for a while because they are not uh, in the way the rulers the conquerors don't want to bother with them because they are sort of peaceful people but their day comes so i think one of the one of the lessons i would Uh, uh learn from this whole experience is is that now as far as your question about what to do in the future i would say that kashmiris need to reintroduce kshatriyata also uh, kashmiris now need to grow kshatriyata within their society i mean they are great learn uh, learned people poets singers authors spiritual people kashmir the home of shaivism i am a shaivite so i i i have a lot of respect for that Uh, buddhism a lot of the tibetan buddhism went for there so the intellectual learning and the spiritual learning is of course always been great but the kshatriyata is needed in this age because this is the age when you are going to be fighting nasty people and you are not going to fight them like gentlemen and try to re- win an argument with them or debate you have to fight like the at their level you have to do that so i think kashmir needs to create a kshatriyata within themselves and collaborate with other uh, uh, you know states other regions to to do this to take back your homeland you need to start with this article 370 uh, gone you need to start a movement to create uh, institutions which hindus can set up in kashmir uh, buying land setting up institutions to claim this taking back the home taking back the homeland and uh, the population of uh, kashmiri hindus in exile is small Uh, but you need to get many other non kashmiris also so i would say that the way you fight is not in isolation as yourself but you need to rope in collaborate with many other people and then and then do it as far as the bigger war is concerned against uh, islamic terrorism uh, you know islam ultimately needs a reform movement in within itself which is not an easy thing to do the reform movement in european uh, christianity took 200 years of infighting and you need a lot of uh, muslims determined to create this kind of an internal reformation what outsiders can do is facilitate that educate some people you know uh, seed that uh, which I, i maybe some attempts are being made but not enough clearly and meanwhile i think uh, the world has to be very strong and able to speak out and call this whole bluff of double talk a uh, lot of muslim friends i have i like them on a personal level they are wonderful people but you know when the subject comes up they will close ranks and uh, go back into their islamic kind of a dialogue in that in that mode of thinking uh, i would like to and and i always like to keep pushing until you know the truth comes out uh, but hindus are afraid to go there we are afraid of controversy we just want to pretend like everything is okay unless we are courageous willing to stick our neck out and willing to uh, you know uh, uh, go up out and out of our way out of our comfort zone into the kurukshetra and fight the good fight uh, i think we can't really change it we can't change just being passive sitting at home and expecting that things will just change in, at the other end they'll change their mind we have to fight for ourselves uh, good uh, you know you look at uh, how uh, punjab did for a very long time 
I mean, unfortunately, now there are some serious problems with decadence of society within Punjab recently. But for a long time, it is the bravery of the Sikhs actually, the fighting spirit that you know we're not uh, we're not going to we're going to make some uh, co co uh, some compromises and accept some of the Muslim ways which they did, but we're going to hold our ground, and we are we are who we are, and and I think this is a this is an amazing story in, in all of India. Uh, so I, I I this is a time for uh, hard power. We talk about soft power. I have been a great student and a proponent of soft power for a long time. All the yoga and all these things, I write a lot about it. This is fantastic and we should do that. That's very important for consumption, for our own people to have a narrative and understand who we are. But when it comes to international relations and all that, we, you know, people respect even your soft power once you have hard power. So if you're a tough guy and if you have uh, strength and you're not going to put up with nonsense, people t respect you. So we we have to India has to train its Ministry of External Affairs. They have to re-educate all of these guys. Uh, the, uh, the gurus have to get involved in this. The gurus cannot just be otherworldly. Uh, we are in, we are d looking for moksha and we don't want to get involved in all that. Uh, the gurus have to play a role. We have a whole history of gurus taking a tough stand, being very strong and helping the uh, the kshatriyas. So kshatriyas should be encouraged, they should not be left alone, they should not be considered, you know, you're too, too controversial, we don't want anything to do with you. We, uh, the whole community has to support these people. And only as a multi-varna ecosystem, where the Vaishyas bring the wealth, the kshatriyas are the political leaders and fighters, and uh, uh, the Brahmins are the intellectual leaders, only when we have all, and the Shudras are playing a role as we're doing their services, only when you have a multi-varna ecosystem which is balanced can you fight the other guys. Ajit, thank you so much. This actually reminds me of the famous Vedic, uh, you know, prose. It says, uh, Ahimsa Parmo Dharma. That's all what we have learned. But the whole couplet says, Ahimsa Parmo Dharma, Dharma Hinsa Tathai Vacha. Which means that, you know, we need to basically, if, if the righteousness is the principality, if the principles are in danger, violence should be there. So we need to basically learn that Parshuram was a Brahmin, but when it when there was a call, he took up weapons and basically slayed the uh, people who were basically creating terror at that time. Thank you, Rajivji, so much. Uh, Tom, uh, I've got a small question for you. Uh, what's happening in our own backyard in Canada when it comes to terrorism? We have seen terrorists being paid, big paid outs, and we are seeing... Uh, Terrorists basically filing lawsuits against themselves and the uh, whole call about Islamophobia in Canada. What are your views about it? Thanks. There was a number of interesting uh, things I'd like to address you said as well. First thing here in Canada, probably worth remembering a little anecdote. The first ever Muslim Brotherhood guy to come to Canada to set up an organization and start pushing political Islam is 1958. Uh, it's only the late 1980s they actually gained momentum. But now through a process of political entryism, we see Islamist extremism, not necessarily violence, not necessarily terrorism, but the whole Islamist extremist attitude is growing rapidly in Canada and it's growing with lots of money because countries like Qatar and Saudi Arabia are putting money in here. So to a point now where we have the uh, for instance, the parliamentary secretary to our prime minister, so like the little, the baby minister to the prime minister, uh, the gatekeeper to him is Omar al Gabra, who openly campaigned for Sharia law in Ontario, who was rejected entry into America on security uh, grounds, which they never explained. Uh, and before he was elected, he openly said that Hamas and Hezbollah were not terrorist groups. So that gives you an idea of just how deeply into our political system a number of these folks have uh, infiltrated themselves. And it a lot of people say, oh, no, you know, we just have to deal with the violent ones. You know, we're not interested in nonviolent extremism. It's like, no, no, you have to be interested in nonviolent extremism because they are preaching, if that's the right term, a supremacist ideology. Uh, and that ideology will eventually confront you and demand that you submit, which is why Tahir Gore and I called our book Submission, The Danger of Political Islam to Canada. When we talk about terrorism, and you talked earlier about uh, the West didn't wake up till 9-11, and you're right, they shouldn't have. I testified to the Senate in Canada in 1998 about terrorism. We had the Air India attack in 1984. There was the World Trade Center attack in 1993. 
nobody learned anything, or very few people learned anything, and most of the politicians were asleep until 9-11. Since then, the biggest single problem we've got is we have spent billions of dollars, put huge amounts of effort into tactical counterterrorism. So when there's a guy with a bomb or a gun or some gas or something, we're getting a lot better at chasing that guy down the back alley. We're a lot better at catching the guns coming across the border, that sort of thing. But at the strategic level, we're doing virtually nothing. And the struggle, terrorism itself, is a tactic. It's a tactic used by a group of people who are angry and want to express themselves through violence. And they're doing that because they have an ideology. That ideology gives them an objective. That objective gives them a strategy and that strategy leads to the tactics. So we're busy fighting the foot soldiers down here and we're fairly good at it. But very few people in the West are willing to actually stand up and say the actual problem is the ideology. It is the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood. It is the ideology of Jama Islamia. It is the ideology of ISIS, Abu Sayyaf Group, Mar Islamic Liberation Front, etc., etc., etc. And here in Canada now, we're not even allowed to talk about it anymore due to the M103 anti-Islamophobia motion, which they're trying to change to say if you're critical of Islamic politics, that's Islamophobia. And it's like, come on guys, you know, we actually have to be able to talk about this problem, which is why freedom of speech is important. Also on this issue of Islamic reform, uh, you're mentioning this, it is kind of occurring. There are a lot of people pushing for it. But right now, for instance, here in Canada, the government is completely captured by the voice of political Islam which is to say the Brotherhood, Jama Islamia, all those sort of front groups they have here in Canada. And the government almost never listens to the reformists or the humanists or the secularists within the Islamic uh, movement. So until the government in Canada and America and Sweden and Belgium and France and Germany and Norway, until they change here in the West, we're not going to see much of a difference. Thank you, gentlemen, for your views. Uh, I would like to tell everybody that today we are going to have an event at the Indo Samurai Center in Toronto to just remember the Holocaust of Kashmiri Hindus, which happened 30 years back. And I request all the viewers to come and join us. And we're talking about global terrorism in light of the exodus of Kashmiri Hindus 30 years back. Thank you. Namaste. Um, I'd like to invite you all to come tomorrow for the event on the exodus of Kashmiri Hindus. Um, it's incredible that this event has been organized with an amazing panel of experts. Uh, we'd like you to come and support the Kashmiri Hindus and show your solidarity with Kashmiri Hindus. There's so much misinformation about Kashmir today uh, in, in mainstream media, on TV, and uh, I think it'll be really good for you to come out and listen to the people who have actually lived through it and who are knowledgeable about the subject. Um, it's been 30 years since this incident, this exodus of the Kashmiri Hindus and Sikhs happened. And many of us who are from India didn't know about it. It's been a huge conspiracy to sweep this whole horrible, horrible history of India under the carpet. But things are changing because the Kashmiri community is now fighting so hard to bring the stories. So again, this is a very, very important event and I encourage you to come and join us. Thank you. I'm very proud to be here as a guest speaker uh, along with a distinguished panel of international speakers on this subject. This subject is very close to my heart for the simple reason that <clears throat> Kashmiris have suffered a lot during what happened 30 years back and subsequent to that as well. The fact remains that Kashmiris are suffering even till today. Kashmiri Hindus had to flee. That's a history 30 years back and that too happened in a manner which was most inhuman. I can relate with that because in 1984-6 faced a very similar situation. I personally feel that such incidents should not go unnoticed and they should be talked about year after year so that lessons are learned from that, so that the history repeats never. History should never repeat. I feel 
that we should talk about it so that it's a deterrent to others forever and nobody should really be in this situation in which Kashmiri Pandits have been f during the last 30 years. Um, I would request that more and more people should come and join so that we talk about this subject and we talk so that the corrective action can be taken for future. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on the uh, very disheartening and very sad event in the history of the subcontinent which is the exodus of the Kashmiri Pandits uh, 30 years from today. It is a really earth-shaking and a groundbreaking kind of moment for all of us that citizens of the country has become stateless in their own state. Um, I totally have all my sympathies for my fellow Kashmiri brothers and sisters. And uh, we just need to uh, uh, go back and assess as to why such kind of anom anomacy did take place and what is the source of it. So uh, if I just uh, want to just say um, there is only one epicenter which emanates this kind of anom anomacy towards India and the uh, Indian people uh, um, and be it through multiple acts of terrorism or you know cross-border infiltration or you know non-state actors whatever you call it um, there is only one epicenter and that has to be dealt with if we want to have perpetual peace in the Indian subcontinent because without peace we cannot go forward